Welcome, everyone, to SI Media with Jimmy Traina. I am your host, Jimmy Traina. Thank you for listening. We have an excellent episode for you today. We've got Ian Eagle from CBS Sports and Turner Sports calling the tournament NBA action. He does Nets games locally. You know him from the NFL. Ian, as entertaining as ever uh, on the pod, got into a lot of subjects. He's going to be calling the Final Four, not this year, but the year after this year. Jim Nance will step aside from the tournament. Ian gets the bump up to the lead assignment at the NCAA tournament. So we get into that and working with Bill Raftery. Got his thoughts on what it's like for Kevin Burkhart dealing with this Greg Olson and Tom Brady situation. Ian does the Nets game. So we talk about the implosion of the Nets with Durant and Irving. So uh, good stuff with Ian. And then Sal Akata back for Train of Thoughts this week after a week off on vacation. Get into uh, a little of Super Bowl stuff because we never talked to Sal about it. Uh, NBA All-Star things. And uh, we get into the baseball rule changes with Sal. So that's this show. If you missed last week, Brian Curtis from The Ringer was on the podcast. He was excellent. We did a big review of Fox's telecast of the Super Bowl. Richard Deitch, two weeks ago. Chris Berman, three weeks ago. Jason McCourty, four weeks ago. If you missed any of those episodes, dip into the archives. Check them out. Subscribe to the pod. Leave a review on Apple. We're going to read them probably next week. All right. That's enough from me. Let's get to Ian Eagle and train of thoughts with Sal Licata. All right here on SI Media with Jimmy Trainer. All right, joining me now, SI Media Podcast regular. It's actually the SI Media with Jimmy Traina podcast. Now, I always forget yeah. that we we put my name in there to massage my ego. <laughs> one of one of everyone's favorites, one of the top play-by-play men in all of sports, Ian Eagle from CBS Sports, Turner Sports. Ian, how are you? Jimmy, doing well. It is all-star break, so I thought, oh, this is going to be awesome. I don't have to shave for five days. And then I get the text from you. Hey, can you do the podcast? And I know there's the video component. So yeah. the back of my mind, of course, my answer is, yeah, I'm in. But I recognize that I then had to shave because yeah. unfortunately, when I have some growth, it doesn't work. It looks like a <laughs> smattering of pudding. So I have to make the decision if you put a clip out there everyone is going to look at it and go, what the hell's going on there? Like, I need a Sharpie to do the connectors. There are some people, you know them, Spiro Didis is one. I'm very jealous. The guy could be cleanly shaven one Saturday on a college basketball game. One week later, he could have a full-grown beard, perfectly manicured. I have no idea how that happens. It's an incredible talent. We all went to like junior high school with people like seventh grade. I show up and like on a Tuesday, one of the kids has a has a beard. I was like, do you have a mortgage? What the hell happened over the weekend? I, 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 I There's a part of me that wishes you didn't go here because now I have so much to say, so many <laughs> questions, so many things to... Because one, I feel awful you shave for this. No one should ever shave for this. And, I, and here's the thing. I always shave for this always it's the only time i shave is for this because of the gray the gray mm. is what I, I can't see right now i'm looking in the zoom i see the gray and i want to kill myself <laughs> but this has been a very very rough week there's been a lot going on so i didn't shave yep and it's like maybe the second time ever i didn't shave while doing this on zoom like for the past two years and you bring up the shaving to start how often now i need to know how often do you shave I shave every game day. So okay. if there are there are days off in between games, I don't shave. I don't need to be on camera. I don't shave. Right. But if I have a game day, I shave. And, and the one other thing that struck me when you texted and I thought about the clips that you've posted and, you know, I go way back with Sal Licata. I love the guy. I really do. What struck me in one of the more recent clips that I saw with Sal and I'm going to make a blanket statement here. I believe that Zoom is very flattering for bald people. He looks I just good every week. They have figured it out. It's it's symmetrical. Uh, you you don't even look at yeah. that area. You just accept that it belongs there. And yeah. Sal, as the latest example, he looks fantastic on yeah. Zoom. Well, here's really the thing does. also about, 
I here's the thing about Sal. Now he has not told me this, but I know Sal like a book. He went away last week because he him and his family went to, I think, Aruba. And I know when Sal goes on these trips, he goes on some maniacal diet for about a month (laughs) before where he doesn't eat sugar and he works out. Because he knows he's taking his shirt off. Exactly. So he's in shape. He looks good. And here's another secret that this is going to blow up Sal's spot. 95% of the time when we tape our segment for this podcast, He's yeah. doing it five minutes after he's on SNY. Oh, so he's, he's got, got makeup. He's got, there it is. It's in full. Ma- you know, that's a Pull great Pull back thing. the curtain. He looks very angular on the Zoom. <laughs> yeah. And I think now there might be some contour going on with yeah. the makeup. And the other part, look, we've all toyed with Zoom. There's this one setting where it will touch up your appearance. And every now and again, I think, oh, let me try that. And then I do it and I look like Madonna at the Grammys. I'm like, whoa, I cannot, I cannot do I, this. And I never go with it. But there is that one moment you're like, yeah, yeah, I want to touch up my appearance. It's time. But I don't, I don't actually. Well, you're not, you know, trigger. you're not one of, you know, the biggest pop star of all time. So no, I don't think you need no. to, I don't think you need to no, worry about it. No, I don't have to touch up. Yeah. But now, I mean, now all I see is the gray and it makes me want to vomit. So I got to try not to look. So I'm going to be looking down a lot while we, while we chat. Yeah. It's interesting that yeah. I went there. Obviously we yeah. had no discussion about this no. whatsoever. And it's it's like as this. if I knew your vulnerability you and did. I just tossed in yeah. kryptonite like yeah. right out of the gate. Usually the fatness is the vulnerability, but they cut this <laughs> where it's like, I'm from the neck up. So you can't see the disaster below the neck. So it's just the gray. If I could just, the gray is the problem. So, um, it's funny. We're speaking. I, I, I saw, I wasn't, I saw something on Twitter earlier and it wasn't in my head to bring this up. And then I thought it would be a good way to start. It's the anniversary. I don't know the year. It's probably 40 years. Today's the anniversary that we're taping this of Al Michaels mm. miracle on ice call. What is Iron Eagle's all-time favorite call? And it doesn't have to be what's, you know, most people consider, uh, uh, do you believe in miracles, the best? But what's your, it doesn't have to be the best. It's what you personally like as a favorite. Yeah, I mean, that, that's up there. That, that was one of those all-time classics where you remember where you were. Like, that's, that's a big part of this of. of I don't, I wasn't watching it. I was like five years old all right so you're young i'm not that young. I, i'm just uh, saying i wasn't watching that game so for me i, it I remember where i was and okay. i remember what was going on in my life at the time and the fact that i avoided the score on the radio to make sure that it was fresh and i knew nothing and i was watching it in its purest most earnest form you know i think the the jack buck Kirk Gibson call is up there as one of the all-time greats where it just captured the moment. If you're a New York guy, you might lean towards a Marv Albert call, even a Bob Murphy call. I don't know if you remember oh, yeah. the game that went into extra innings and Murph, they win the damn thing, mm-hmm. five to the, whatever it was. But yep. the fact that he said damn on the air yeah. because it was a marathon of a game, it's those kind of calls that – that stick with you over time, but yeah, yeah. The do you believe in miracles? I think it just captured what everybody was thinking, and that's what a, a great call is supposed to do. It's supposed so do you- to shed light on what is in your deepest, deepest feelings and emotions, and then uncork it in that moment. Do you remember? He- so, since you heard that call, do you remember? having it almost trigger you in terms of like, I want to do this for a living or this is something cool or did that come later? Yeah, I had known I was 10, but I had already known by eight or nine what I wanted to do. So at that point I was very much aware and I was paying attention to all of these things, mostly Marv Albert in New York because he was doing the Knicks and the Rangers and he was doing the local NBC news at six and 11 o'clock, but on a national level, that was a big moment if you were an aspiring sportscaster because that call just stuck with you. Do you believe in miracles? Miracles, the idea of that. And then the added part, you know, my dad was in a very successful advertising campaign concurrently with that. And it was a Xerox campaign. And 
the the slogan on the campaign was it's a miracle so it resonated with me even more my dad was making a a good living yeah. doing yeah. this doing commercials at that point starting to work for xerox in a personal services deal where he was traveling the country as the monk and opening up kinko shops so that word meant a lot in my household and i was actually watching the game in his study he was not there you know i had a really interesting family background my father's first wife was staying with me and we watched the game together and not i'm not related to her you know i i called her my ex-mom that was our our little thing but my mom was living on the west coast had moved to la at that point my dad was traveling and i watched that game with with his first wife yeah that's why it's embedded in your brain completely embedded in my brain <clears throat> you said something there that i want to touch on just for people listening because i don't know if this was a regular thing across the country we're both new yorkers you mentioned marv and you said something there I don't know how many people listening to this realize this. Um, back in the 80, early, mid-80s, Marv Albert used to do the 6 o'clock sports report on the right. local NBC channel, then get over to the Garden to do the Knicks or the Rangers, and then get back to NBC to do the 11 o'clock. Now, you say that today, and people probably don't believe that's a real thing yeah. that happened. How insane is that? Is that, what, that, that was what happened with Marv those years utter insanity and then would do nbc sports on the weekends so right. would do either an nfl game or a, a boxing match or pre-game post-game for mlb whatever that assignment was he would then shoehorn it in yeah. i was blown away and honestly that's really what what drew me to this business was the idea that you could just go from event to event to event and get paid to do it. And the fact that Marv did it so well, did it at such a high level, there was such a consistency in his approach in how he came across in all of these different games. And then, yeah, you're right, pop up, 6 o'clock news with Sue Simmons and Chuck, Chuck Scarborough. Scarborough, and then the 11 o'clock news doing the wrap-up. And I would just think to myself, he just did the game. <laughs> How the hell yes. is he at the studio doing highlights yeah. of the other game? It was it was mind boggling. It, would, it would be great web content now for someone to have filmed him and done video of how he oh. goes from NBC News to the Garden back to NBC News. You're right. You're right. That that would have been a perfect in the city yeah. HBO real sports. Yeah. That yeah. would have been a a perfect segment for them. And. To wrap up the miracle on ice and we'll move on. I got to just tell this quick story. I so on it was the anniversary of when the the OJ car chase which mm. when I hear OJ car chase the only thing I think of is the prank call to Peter Jennings where yes. the guy said I see OJ and then Al ha and Peter Jennings believes the whole thing and Al has to come on and say lest anything lest anyone think that was a real call it was totally farcical. Farcical, yep. Yeah. And bef this was before I had ever had any contact exchanges anything with Al. I write in my column that day that I know everyone thinks Miracle on Ice is Al's best call, but for me, it'll <laughs> always be this. And he actually emailed me out of the blue and said, I agree with you. That's my favorite call too. <laughs> so all these people who love Miracle on Ice, Al likes the Howard Stern prank call better. Oh, that's so hilarious. I just had to get that out. And, and it's funny <clears throat> because you, you think about, all right, where was I during that moment? During that particular moment, that I, I was at MSG Okay. The NBA finals were going on, if you remember correctly. Yeah, Knicks and Rockets. Knicks and Rockets. And I'm doing stuff for FAN at that point. I'm in the back as this thing is now breaking on screen. Chuck Daly was doing pre and post for NBC. I end up standing next to him as this is unfolding on television. And he just turns to me, he goes, what the hell is going on there? I was like, uh, and I, now I'm trying to explain. Yeah, OJ Simpson is being followed. There's a camera, and nobody knows how this is going to end. And, you know, there were some other words exchanged there that I'm not going to yeah. recreate yeah. now. But Chuck was, and it was just me, Chuck, and then a bunch of other media people watching the screen. And there is video, if you want to look it up, of Bob Costas. Someone has the raw footage, it's on YouTube somewhere 
of him handling that situation. And it's not just the on-air portion, it's off-air portion of him getting instructions in his ear as to what was happening, what's, and then the added part was Bob's relationship with OJ. So the surreal nature yeah. of Costa's navigating that, traffic copying that situation, and then still somehow doing it at an exceptionally high level. It, it was strange. It was a strange, strange night, strange time. I think for, for my lifetime, just for when I was alive, to me, that's the wildest sports night in the history of sports yeah, yeah. from my life. I, you maybe you, if someone wants to make the argument, the, the jazz with COVID, um, yeah, it was bizarre. Who, who was the Rudy Gobert? No, who was Rudy it? Gobert? Yeah. You're Rudy right. Gobert. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You could go there. I, for me, the OJ, the OJ chase combined with the NBA finals that to me, craziest night in the history of sports. While well, I've been but alive. you just said it though. If you can remember what was happening in your life at that exact moment, mm-hmm. that means it had a, fairly large impression on you and the Gobert yeah. situation. I know exactly where I was. I was in a yeah. hotel room in San Francisco. And the second it happened, I just went to the airport. I knew that the Nets warriors oh, were wow. canceled. I walked outside. I ordered an Uber. I got in the car. I went directly to the airport. I did not have a flight. My flight was the next night, a red eye. And I went to the counter and it was eerie. I know that there was chaos everywhere. There was not chaos at the San Francisco airport. It was right before the chaos. And I just walked right up to the counter. Phones, you couldn't even get on the United app. And I went directly to the counter and said, hey, I've got a red eye tomorrow. Any way of switching it to tonight? And the woman behind the, the counter and the keyboard, she goes, yeah, let's take a look. Yeah, you're good. I was like, thank you. Yeah, and you was it. stuck. Yeah. Bizarre. Yeah. So you're yeah. right. Because well, the chaos kind of really didn't you. start, I think, to like two days later. Well, that's when... Because if you remember, if I remember correctly, the Gobert thing happened, the NBA shut down, but the next day, like the Big East played like the they first did. half of the tournament. They <laughs> did. This is most ridiculous. And the other part, Jimmy, I get on that plane. So I take a red eye now the night that uh, Trump addresses the nation, Gobert, the whole situation goes down. And on the plane, not an exaggeration, one mask. There was one guy sitting two rows in front of me that was wearing a mask and in the back of my mind i was like yeah that that's odd yeah Yeah. that's what what's going on there like that's where right your mind was because when it first happened they would tell us wear gloves and don't you know wash everything down and then when they got a hold of what this was then they they were able to figure it out it was tom hanks and rudy gobert on the same night that's so if you're on that plane, I would imagine the Tom Hanks news too was. Well, and the other people. part, just on a personal level, Jimmy, that yeah. happened in Australia. My daughter was abroad in Australia. My wife was visiting her. Oh my that God. same night, all of this news breaks. Tom Hanks, positive in Australia. NBA shut down. I get on a red eye. And then the crazy part, this is psychosomatic, of course. Yeah. I don't sleep on that red eye. A, I'm not a great plane sleeper to begin with. And with everything that was going on, I get zero minutes of sleep. I land, I get to my house, my wife and my daughter in Australia, I'm trying to figure out how the hell to get her out of there. And at that point, I've convinced myself, I have COVID because I feel like complete (laughs) crap. Right. right. I didn't have COVID, but I was just so run down and mentally fatigued from everything that was going on. I got to ask, how do you, how did your wife and daughter end up getting, were they able to get back? Yeah. So I got my okay. wife out the next day. Okay. Uh, we got her to Houston and then Houston to Newark. My daughter ended up staying for another 10 days, eight oh, to wow. 10 days, and then got her out through San Francisco. Uh, it was messy. Uh, obviously, it was really messy for a lot of people at that time, but mm. the stress came from the the mystery of whether or not they were going to just shut down all travel out of australia into the u.s it it was uh hairy a hairy situation to say the least i had a cousin of mine who was in peru and was stuck there for a very long time it was very scary and it was not good um yeah this was really uplifting jimmy great great stuff well we can talk about you know, you taking over for Nance and getting some happy <laughs> thoughts. And before I, we got to talk about that because next year you'll, we have Jim Nance will call the final four this year. And then Ian takes over and we will discuss that. I'm going to ask you one thing before we get to that, just because 
the big media news over the last, you know, several weeks is, you know, Greg Olson has emerged here with Fox as a as a very popular analyst. Yep. Brady's going to come in after his off year next year. And I'm fascinated in all of this, in the Kevin Burkhart situation of it. And you can maybe shed some light as the play-by-play guy. So you're the play-by-play guy. You have this really good partnership because he's been partners with Olsen for a couple of years. Yep. And I, I've said this before on the podcast. I think if it was any other player coming in, maybe Burkhart or Fox rethinks the situation, but it's the greatest quarterback of all time. You're not going to pass up that brand coming to your network. What If, if you're Burkhart there, how... We'll use a Chris Mad Dog Russo word here. How dicey is that <laughs> scenario for Burkhardt and navigating it? He is in a tough spot, Jimmy. No, he uh, he's a pro and he's so easy to work with and so malleable. He's going to be able to adjust whatever the decision is. The fact that they have another year together, I think for both of them probably is a sense of relief that it didn't end with the Super Bowl. They get to do this for another year. There will be speculation as to what Tom wants to do. He's taking a year to figure out exactly what he wants. Does he want to do this every weekend? Does he want to uh, make this that big a part of his life? And he might love being off for a year. So if you're Greg Olson, you do what you've been doing. Go out, do excellent work. He and Kevin are a terrific team. I ended up doing a couple of things with Greg when he was still in the NFL during COVID. I got hired to do two events that were done remotely uh, via Zoom or one of these other platforms. And I was blown away at how honest he was, uh, how uh, sharp he was, how much insight he provided just in that setting. You could tell this guy had a chance to be really good at this. So it's yeah. not that shocking that he's done this at a very high level. If you're Kevin, yeah. go about your business. That That's the only thing you can do. The other part of the story too, Jim, it, it, these are arranged marriages. You don't get right. to choose who you work with. Management makes the decision. You put your trust in that. And then I can just tell you from my perspective, you go out and you make it work. That's your job. Yeah. Yeah. Your job is to make it work. I feel bad for Burkhart from this standpoint. I feel bad's a little strong. I mean, the guy's the lead NFL announcer for Fox. But if it work, if the plan goes as it's supposed to, where the year after next, Dolson is removed to the and goes to number the two booth, and Brady comes in. I feel, I've said this the last few weeks. I feel like Brady comes in with a target on his back. Fans are really taken to the Burkhart and Olsen booth. Mm -hmm. And I've used the wrestling term where Brady comes in as a heel. I mean, you have a lot of people who don't like Tom already NFL fans, which I don't think is rational. That's my own opinion on it. Um, But he comes in sort of behind the eight ball. And that's tough for, you know, Burkhart, who is having such success with Olsen. Like you said, he's a professional. He'll make it work. Sure. But, you know, I I feel for him from that standpoint, because I think and maybe this is what you could talk about, too. I mean, when you've established now, it'll be four, five, six years with Olsen. And he's got to change again. I'm sure that's not ideal, even if it is Tom Brady. And like I said, this is only happening because it's Tom Brady. If this is someone else, yep. it's not happening. Tom in the Sergeant Slaughter role was not what I was anticipating here, Jimmy. But me, me either. I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Uh, look, I can I can only speak from my own experience and also experience with Tom. Tom is extremely likable, extremely smart, and extremely insightful. I think he has a chance to be great at this if he wants to do this and truly do it full time. This guy hasn't done anything poorly. Anything he puts his mind to, he's going to do well. Uh, if if he puts the time and effort in like I think he will, he'll want to be the best at it. And you're right. There'll be the natural backlash because, A, it's Tom Brady, so there are many fans who – already have a general feeling on him. And then the second part, there are fans that like the pairing. Yep. And rightfully so. They've yep. been excellent together. So, yeah. Is there an X on his back? Yeah. He's dealt with a lot worse. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I don't think yeah. that it's something that, that he would lose a whole lot of sleep over. I think the part that he's going to have to determine is, is he all in? If you're all in, then – 
this, not to say it consumes every bit of your being, but knowing him, he'll want to be great. And being great requires you to put the time and effort in. Yeah. I'm with you on everything you said. And I think, I think there's a lot of people that don't like Tom because of what he did on the field. And I think yep. those people don't realize, I mean, I've heard from so many people who know him that, you know, f- really funny, yeah, great personality. He didn't show it all those years in New England because of Belichick showed it more when he went to Tampa. You shared a great story on here about Tom where he shamed you for <laughs> eating donuts and soda. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I'd like to see him give it a shot and it just, it stinks that it would have to be at, you know, sort of Olsen's, yeah. um, I don't know the word I'm looking for. But yeah, expense, we'll but... Expense, yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't That's know. Look, yeah. I think also if you've proven yourself in this business as as a commodity, as somebody that networks want to work with, then good things will happen. Yes. Greg's done very well. Greg's a really terrific guy, uh, works hard at this, cares, cares a lot, and that comes across on the air. It matters to him. So... If it's there, if it's somewhere else, you don't know. It's it's an unpredictable business. Just do quality work, treat people the right way, and odds are things will eventually work out in your favor. Perfect transition because that's what happened to you. And now after this year, you will call the final four for CBS. Jim Nance will do it this year from Houston, which is obviously uh, has special meaning for Jim. And yep. then you, do you know, where's the final four of the year you do it that first year? Uh, it's right up your alley, Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe I'll make a trip. Maybe I'll make a trip, visit you and Raph. Um, you know, I heard Sean McManus, the chairman of CBS Sports, he was on with Dog last week on Sirius. Um, Dog grilling him about Tony Romo, which was funny. And uh, he asked about you and Sean said, you deserve to be able to call this. You deserve a, a lead assignment. That's really I, nice. How did you tell me like how you got the news and, and how it all came down for you? And were you surprised? And I'm sure you were ecstatic, but give us a little behind the scenes of getting the news that you'd be calling the final four uh, the year after this. Yeah, this had been talked about the last couple of years as a possibility. Nothing that was etched in stone, but you know, certainly a discussion. And uh, I knew that it was something in the back of their mind. A lot of it was based on Jim and and his decision moving forward as to what he was going to do in regards to the event. I think it was really important to him to do the final one in Houston, to have this full circle moment. So the idea of succeeding him, and that's really what it is. I'm succeeding him in this role. I'm not replacing him. What he's done is unprecedented. It will never be matched to do 30 years of this event as the play-by-play announcer means that you are in many ways synonymous with it. And for me, it's a huge honor and a huge responsibility, but I can't even say that there was one specific moment of that's it, it's happening. It really was the buildup of conversation over a couple of years trying to figure out what the schedule would look like. And um, you know, my assumption is that eventually, a conversation took place between Jim and, and management and the determination was made that uh, this this would be the, the final one for him. So uh, it's it's really a wonderful story for him. For me, there will be plenty of time to, to talk about my background in it and the NCAA tournament and what have you. But for now, I think it's best that that the focus is on on Jim and uh, he gets to go out in style. And he will, I'm sure, especially with, with that final four in Houston. And yes, you deserve all the praise. You deserve the gig. Here's what I want to talk about in terms of you call. I mean, we got to get a year there. So hopefully everything, but getting reunited with Raftery, if, if <laughs> that is the plan where, cause it's Raftery and Grand Hill. Yeah. Now I understand, you know, people want to talk about Raftery's age and everyone's an ageist. They've, I, I if they want, they have to give us at least one year. Of Ian and Raf together. Don't. Yeah, I, no, will, I, I think that's I will. I will write columns plan. about CBS every day if I have to. <laughs> if they, I we need one year of Ian and Raf three together because I don't think people understand the phenomenal pairing. What, tell me what when the news broke did did you hear from Raf? Uh, I I talked to Raf a lot, so yeah. it really was just in the midst of our general conversation. It wasn't a specific call. 
It was more talking about other things and then thrown in the middle, like, oh, yeah, I heard the news. That's great. I Somehow I end up doing a rap impression every time I'm on with you. Jimmy, I have no idea if there's an over-under in Vegas. How many rap impressions will he do over the course of the podcast? Yeah, look, Raph and I go back to, well, 1994 in terms of a relationship, real relationship, but the first time I met, truly met Bill, other than him doing a Syracuse game during my four years there, it was the Big East Tournament, Madison Square Garden, 1990, my senior year. I have to do a pregame interview with somebody before the Syracuse game in the Big East Tournament, and Raf is standing on the court walking towards his broadcast location, and I kind of went with the screw it attitude. I just went directly up to him and said, uh, hey, Mr. Raftery, coach, uh, I'm Ian Eagle. He goes, what? Like, what does that mean? I'm Ian Eagle. I work uh, WAR Syracuse. Do you have a few minutes for a pregame interview? And Jimmy, you know how this stuff works. Mm -hmm. He could absolutely blow me off there, and nobody would even think twice about it. And what does he do? He says, uh, yeah, kid, let's go. That's it. (laughs) And we did it right there. Three minutes, three and a half minutes. You know, classic Rav talking about the tournament and uh, a couple of sayings here and there. And I shake his hand at the end and wrap up and head way upstairs because that's where they put you for college radio up in the hockey press box and tell my broadcast part, I got Bill Raftery and oh my God, that's huge. Like that's, that's, a that's the great part yeah. about this this journey in many ways that uh, people that you looked up to that you've now had a chance to to interact with and people that I looked up to growing up and wanting to be in this business and to find out they're actually genuine good human beings and that's what Bill is he's yeah he's the best and he called me kid which is par for the course and knowing Bill now like I know him all these years later I realized that no matter what I say, no matter who I mention to him, said hello or sent their best, he then backs it up with, oh, he's a great kid. So I don't know, a couple of years ago, I was in the company of Jerry West and he said, oh, what, what game do you have this weekend? I told him, oh, I'm doing this game, Kentucky, Florida with Bill Rafter. He said, oh, I'll send him my best. So I see <laughs> Bill, I said, hey, uh, I saw Jerry West. He sends his best. He goes, oh, what a nice kid. I go, what a nice kid. <laughs> it's the, the math doesn't work, man. No, it does not, does not add up. That's great. <laughs> That's great. And then, and then you call a tournament with him a year for final four with him a year from now. It's amazing. It's amazing. Crazy. It's great. Um, now, obviously I became fans of you and Raftery calling the Nets games. You still call the Nets games. They have had a surreal season to say the least. Yes. Were you stunned? Forget Kyrie because he's a disaster. Were you stunned when they traded Durant? Not stunned. Uh, I thought the dominoes could fall. There was a part of me that probably deep down knew once the Kyrie thing went south that that was the point of no return. And whatever agreements and discussions took place over the summer, which were real, and Kevin Durant agreeing to come back, not forcing the Nets to trade him, there might have been a caveat in there of, hey, if this thing breaks apart, I still want the option of being dealt. And will you live up to that word, which Josiah, Sean Marks, and the Nets did. So my understanding of it is they realized that KD was going to want out no matter what, and it was a matter of, Can you get the best deal now and begin the process of trying to build this team back up? Or do you try to get by with the group and hope that KD is fully engaged and fully energized and fully on board? And the determination was made that it was best to make the the full rip of the Band-Aid, which is what they did. Obviously, they deem the situation untenable and recognize that it was irreparable. Uh, they were not going to be able to to fix this, even though they had done it a couple of times before. They were not going to be able to pull it off again. What's been the vibe with the Nets fans since the trade? Do you feel like it's 
been a huge setback in terms of them being demoralized? Do you feel like, okay, we're starting over, but yeah, you know, Mikael Bridges is a good player. Got a little nucleus here. What's the vibe inside of like Barclays now on the night? Yeah, basis? probably more the latter of, mm. all right, there's some good pieces here. It looks like it's a fun, entertaining team. The one sobering part of it is you have to know you're not winning a championship. So right. you went into the last three seasons with the notion that you could win an NBA title and that didn't happen. They came close with a conference semifinal appearance, Kevin Durant's toe, if it's behind the line, they beat the Bucks in a game seven and that sets off a chain reaction. Mike Budenholzer probably gets fired by Milwaukee. Giannis Adetokounmpo may ask out. His reputation would have been highly questioned that he couldn't win a championship or get a team over the top. Durant would have gotten to the Eastern Conference Finals. They would have played the Atlanta Hawks. Odds are they would have beaten the Atlanta Hawks even without Kyrie and James Harden, who was banged up. And then maybe an NBA Finals appearance against the Phoenix Suns. Who knows at that point? Phoenix might win a title. Chris Paul's legacy is completely different. So you have this sliding doors effect on one play. Kevin Durant's toe is on the line, ties the game at the end of regulation to force overtime, game seven of the conference semifinals, instead of winning the game with a three. Steve Nash, who knows at that point, if he goes to an NBA Finals, if he wins a championship, well, he's probably not getting fired uh, a couple of years later. So from my perspective, you had to, you had to swing the bat. You yeah. had a chance to get Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Jimmy, the way it happened probably was pretty telling in how it was going to evolve. They were basically told, the Nets, right as the clock struck midnight on free agency, that both are coming. There was no meeting. There was no presentation in the Hamptons. There was no sit down to talk about what kind of team they want to build and uh, what kind of, of culture they've developed. None of that happened. They were told, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving are coming. They're a package deal. Are you in? Mm, yeah, we're in. And that was it. Yeah. That's how the relationship started. And it kind of ended the same way uh, without a whole lot of fanfare and conversation. And it was just poof, over. Yeah. I mean, well, Kyrie had way, you know, he was way more of a headache than Durant. I mean, I think <clears throat> obviously if Kyrie stayed, Durant probably would have stayed. Yes. I, Kyrie. I believe, that's what would yeah. have happened. Yes. Yeah. Was it? Was it difficult for you at all? Obviously, you're a professional. You have a job to do. But when Kyrie is, you know, promoting an anti-Semitic movie and then defending yep. it and, and saying all this just wacky stuff, is that difficult for you to be in that arena calling his games? Sure. It is. You know, yeah. it's, it's hard not to allow the personal stuff to seep in to what you do. Now, when the headset goes on and... I'm calling a game. My job is to best describe what's happening on the court, on the field. And if you're not doing that, then you're not doing your job well. So I could separate and compartmentalize the job. But yeah, of course, on a personal level, uh, there there's a lot of of questioning, why is this happening? Why 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 are you going there and when given the opportunity my dealings with Kyrie have all been very positive on a personal level but look there's not a whole lot of the back and forth like there used to be the way things are set up it's not it's not really going to happen that way you're not around the players at the level that you once were in traveling with an NBA team separate buses uh, the way you board the plane, the players go one way, you go the other way, completely different sitting area. And you would have to make a really conscious effort to to get in there in order to interact at the level that you used to. The way it was when I started with the Nets, one bus, 
you might sit next to a player on the bus or on the plane. That's how the setup was. Wow. There really was Changed not a lot. the separate areas of of how you yeah. did things. And look, that doesn't mean it's a positive, it's a negative. It's just the reality of of what it is. Uh, years yeah. ago, I know you're you're a big fan of Richard Jefferson. Yes. RJ was on the Nets. RJ was a pisser from day one. Hmm. Uh, just a natural contrarian, ball buster, the whole nine yards. And the Nets signed a player, uh, drafted him by the name of Zoran Planinic from Croatia. He knew zero English, zero. And Richard Jefferson told him, hey, look, you want to learn English? Watch the Chappelle show. You'll learn yeah. English. So I'm the only dude on the bus before a road trip. And Zoran Planinich, this is about a month into the season, walks onto the bus. I'm the only guy on the bus. And I nod my head. I go, hey, what's up, Zoran? He goes, I am Rick James, bitch. Oh, my God. That's it. And just Are you walking. serious? Yes, 100%. So you want to get to know somebody? You can get to know them in that setting. Um, that is unbelievable. And I'm sure yeah. Richard was very proud of his effort. Oh, my gosh. When I told yeah. him the story, he yeah. he doubled over in laughter. And yeah. um, so to to wrap it up on, yeah. on Kyrie, there's not a whole lot of FaceTime yeah. between player and broadcaster, maybe on the layup line, a what's up, a handshake, but not a lot of yeah. deep, detailed time. Uh, mm -hmm. With Kyrie, I think he boxed himself into a corner. And instead of just saying, hey, I screwed up, I'm sorry, I didn't realize, that would have solved a no. lot of these issues, but double down. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, it's like Fonzie, Jimmy. He, he just couldn't say I was wrong, wrong. <laughs> he would never. And here's what, and obviously this is far from the worst thing he did. I personally, I am so tired of, and I hate the fake public apology mm -hmm. that happens because people are pissed off about something. And you know, like last week, Tiger apologizing because he handed the guy the tampon. I mean, yep. the, just can you imagine writing that headline, Tiger Woods, but whatever. So I hate the fake, but Kyrie did the apology. And then the day he got traded to Dallas, deleted it from his Instagram. That's even worse. Like, it's just, what are you yeah. doing? What a, oh God. Um, yeah, enough about Kyrie. Uh, yeah, Richard Jefferson. I would imagine it's a lot of fun to work with on the on the Nets games. He is. He, he doesn't. He doesn't is. seem like he's. He seems like he's always on. Is there ever? Is Richard ever not on? Oh no 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 no! It, off the air, you okay. can get him in a tranquil moment. And uh, Richard is a really smart dude. Yeah. He is unpredictable, yes, in many ways, but eager to excel. So I just know in my yeah. own experience on the broadcast side, he had very little experience. You know, he had done the yeah. podcast a bit, but he was trying to go into traditional media. And the first game we did together, first couple of games we did together, I could tell it was going to work because he was himself. Yeah. And that's, that's always the key. key. Always. Yeah. Always. Can you crack the veneer? Right. And with Richard, it was not hard. <laughs> the headset went on and he doesn't have much of a filter he made over a hundred million dollars as a player so i don't think he fears recourse like others may fear it he cares he cares about his reputation he cares about doing quality work he cares about being a good teammate all of those things and he cares about TikTok. actually <laughs> doing yeah, and and doing a good job and yeah. and having insight and bringing something to the table that matters to him but he is a naturally funny guy and that does come across on television and he doesn't really hold back to to a point he knows yeah. there's a lot we we've gotten right up to the line i think i've joked on the air uh, with him i said oh, it's always so exciting to work with you richard because every broadcast could be your last broadcast <laughs> it might be over yeah. tonight that would be terrible no I uh, I messaged him about three hours ago to come on the podcast next week. So if you want to just tell him to check his message, <laughs> yeah. I'd appreciate that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Richard yeah. really responds to that well. Yes, yeah. I'm People sure. telling him what to do. <clears throat> two, I have two ridiculous ones here to end this podcast because you're always good for stuff like this. Do you know the first question that comes up when you when your name is Googled? No. 
Why does Ian Eagle pronounce his name like that? Oh, I probably I should have said that. that's just lame. That's, that's the lame, number one isn't thing. It? It's lame. Well, Especially it's when also Ian Zeri paved the way, and you know. yeah, it's also that people are under the impression mm. that I chose it somewhere along the way. <laughs> that like at age sixteen, I said enough of this Ian crap. I'm going all in on Ian. Like I didn't pick it. This was not me. My parents. My parents picked it. Very good. Um, and then the last thing is, today is when we're taping this today, this is the day Aaron Rodgers is supposed to emerge from his darkness retreat. How mm. long can I and Eagle last in a darkness retreat? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Are there drugs involved, Jimmy? Uh, from what he, well, uh, I don't think I'm allowed to say what I want to say here, but okay. it's Aaron Rodgers, but what he's, I, I, the way he made it, you know, made a 10 on McAfee was no light, dark room, a slot mm. for them to bring him food mm. and absolutely nothing else. And then of course was stunned that people found this, you know, yeah. bizarre, the, the get, perpetual victim. Do I get Netflix? There will Netflix be, for the day? There will be no devices. No devices. No devices. Just you Honestly, and your thoughts. Like, you and if your you thoughts. said to me, gun to your head, I could make it one day. I believe really? I, I, I believe I could make it one day. I believe I could. Uh, alone with my thoughts, trying to find a meditative state, I believe I could make it one day. But not two. I don't believe I could make it two. Yeah. I'm being honest, just like yeah. I'm being honest about my name, that it's yeah. Ian, that my yeah. parents gave me this name. I did not change it at any point. This was my birth name. I honestly believe I could go one, one day. day. One. Yeah. I think, yeah, I would think if you can sleep for a bulk of time and then yeah. you wake up and then it's get me the hell out of here. Yeah. I could do one. I just, I, I just have so many questions. I just have so many <laughs> questions. Like the food is handed to him in a slot. Yeah. How are you supposed to eat the food if you can't see? Oh, great point. Thank you. I feel only. I'm not even going to get into the bathroom issues, but just how do you eat if you can't yeah. see what you're eating? Like there, you'd have to have like jello of some sort. I could feel <laughs> that. I would know yeah. it's jello. Everything else. How are you cutting a steak in the dark? Oh, yeah. No, I'm sure it's a steak. That's what they're giving them yeah, with no. a full cutlery. No <laughs> doubt about it. <laughs> What, and and now and now here in New York we're we're dealing with headlines that go Jets interested in David Carr yeah. but waiting for Aaron Rodgers to come out of his darkness street. I'm like the whole world has gone mad. Does that it? Does no one see what's going on here? Yeah. Like, Secondary yeah. headline: Aaron Rodgers has Ruth's Chris in darkness yeah. room. I mean, if you're gonna be you, be, if you're gonna be stuck in the dark, you better have a good meal. What That's else? Right. You, get, you know, a good sizzling steak that yeah, I could feel. That I would know. I would know. I could feel and hear that butter popping. But you're cutting, you know, you, if when you're cutting it in the dark, it could be a major <laughs> That's what concerned you of all the things. Uh, how would I cut my food, man? Well, how do you just see anything that you're eating? I have no what? idea. It's a great where, point. Where do, you, where do you stab the fork? Is he in a loincloth? What is he wearing in the darkness? Oh, that's the other part. What, what's hap Are you in full sweatpants, sweatshirt? I don't, don't even know if he's allowed to have it. Well, what, is yeah, what if, if he gets hot and cold, he can't work the thermostat. He can't is see it, anything. Uh, yeah. Is it not climate? Are you in, are you in like someone's attic? Is that what it is? So it's he climate it, control. He said it was a, a very, cave? very small house. He said a small house. Small house. I'm assuming by that it means like a room, a bedroom. I mean, there's no need for a kitchen. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. These are great 40. questions, Jimmy. Well, you'll you'll get to interview him before a game and you can find <laughs> when the wait. NFL starts next year and he's actually good. He's good in production meetings, I'll tell you yeah. that. He is well, he, very he, good. He loves he's to talk. A, he's he a smart dude. Yeah, maybe too smart. Or maybe. he I mean, or he's smart and thinks everyone's dumb. I think that's a lot of the uh I think that might be what's going on there, but who knows. Um I appreciate it. Enjoy the tournament coming up. You got NBA playoffs coming up. This is when you uh you get busy. And uh, yeah, yeah, a little do bit. they like? Is it official that it's you and um? Oh my god, why am I drawing a blank now? And your college basketball partner for the <laughs> tournament? I can't believe I just did that. Oh wait a second! Oh my, it's god. one of the I was great gonna, names. I was going to say Jim Spinarkle. Yeah, it is Spinarkle. Yeah. Oh, well, I thought. Okay, I thought. Okay, 
Yeah. Well, you guys have done that for how many years now? 20. Oh my God. Three, maybe the two of us, 23. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's you wild. know, it's March when you yeah. hear the word spinarkle. Yes. It's officially March. I know it's March because no one who's paid attention to college basketball all season all of a sudden now starts <laughs> telling me about their brackets. And I'm That's like, right. oh, who's going to make Everyone's all of a sudden an expert. You're right. Did you hear by any chance on Tuesday night, Reese Davis with the bacon? I saw it on your, uh, on your clip. How that good was, was that? That was oh, good. Great. Fun. That was I love good. that stuff. I mean, to me, yeah, well, it's part of your job as a play by play announcer to, to, allow the viewer or listener to know what's happening on site. So if there is a round of cheers and it doesn't pertain necessarily to the game or the score, you better know what's going on. So I give Reese a lot of credit that that means he was prepared for the moment. You throw in a little sizzling action. That's the way it should be done. And and his, his call sounded genuine. It didn't seem like he was trying to act. No, that's what I liked about it. It was genuine. He was genuinely happy for getting, uh, free bacon. I don't know if that counts for announcers, but the fans got free bacon. Yeah. Well, a few things you can, that's, a, that's better than them throwing t-shirts into the crowd. As far as I'm concerned, Ian, always a pleasure. Thanks for doing this. All right, and, Jimmy. Uh, I'm going to be well, I'm going to start growing a beard right now. Okay. You have a few days off here so you can get the beard <laughs> scenario <laughs> yeah. going. It won't All look right. good. Trust All me. All right. Take care. Thanks. See you, bud. Be well. All right. Joining me now after a week off, as he does every week for our weekly train of thought segment from WFAN Radio in New York, SNY TV in New York, my buddy Sal Akata. Sal, are we feeling refreshed after a week in Aruba? Um, not, not really. Not as much as I thought I would be. It was great. It goes too freaking fast, though. Now, you got home in time for the Super Bowl, right? When did you come home? Yeah, I got home Friday night, late that Friday night before the Super Bowl, and then I was back in time, of course, Super Bowl Sunday, right back into I worked Sunday morning on the band, then the overnight after the Super Bowl, so back to the hectic schedule. Now, we've spoken since, but I, we have not talked about the Super Bowl or halftime. Just Do you have any Rihanna thoughts? The only thing I'll say, well, two things on it. I love Rihanna, number one. Uh, right. I'm a fan of hers. I love her songs. I thought the show itself was whatever. It didn't do anything for me. And the so I was watching it with my family, and mm-hmm. one of the members happens to be my six-year-old niece. Obviously, you have nieces. You know how this is. I don't – my daughter's too young. So this is really the first time I was in a spot where I had to kind of explain the crotch move or whatever. And, and I joked around about said something that maybe she has an itchy butt, you know, when she grabbed her. But but I was in an uncomfortable spot. For me, I don't care. It'll get offended. But as an uncle in that spot, what are you supposed to do? That that's my you, only. You just thought. say it's it's a dance move. That's all. Yeah, I know. It's but it was, move. you know, you had no issue. I don't care myself. Like I said, and I'll figure it out. But it was just the, the first time I ever had to actually think about. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, a six year old. I, I I'm shocked that a six year old would pick up on that. Um, yeah. But well, yeah, I mean, watching her, you know, do certain movements i think is different than you know w- what's she doing there you know so i just joked around about it the if funny thing is bug. for most of it she really didn't move around that much i mean correct she wasn't you know putting forth a ton of effort it looked like so yeah for, did you know I she same, was pregnant right away i did not i'm such no, an idiot i was like no. i'll be honest i was like half paying attention i wasn't like fully i'm looking at the halftime wagers on the phone <laughs> and i have it on in the background and i'm you know i'm interested in the songs but like you know i like I said, we've talked about this before. That's not for me because if if it's an artist I like, like I mean, I like her, but I'm not like you know a, a diehard. I don't need the 500 dancers dressed in the white marshmallow. Like I'd rather just have one person there singing songs. I'm very old fashioned. Just give me one person singing the songs. I don't need the spectacle. It's not for me though. So, um, you know, I thought it was fine. I thought so, like people were like, like there were some people like you know. Just like what an amazing performance! Like no, it wasn't. There's was nothing yeah. amazing, but whatever. I, I just yeah, you're right. It's bottom line is not for us. So it's not for uh, us. the game is for me. That's it. And the right. game was great. I thought. Yes, until the refs decided. to. Oh, will you stop it? Did you have the Eagles? <sighs> no, I I had a great. I went five and one on my wagers, but nice. And I and I was rooting for the Chiefs. I just it's just 
not yeah, there. Yeah, I know. It, not it, there. It, it, it ruined the, what could have been a, a even better ending, but I'm not letting it mar yeah. the game. Plus, I had the Chiefs, so I was happy. Couldn't care less. <laughs> so yeah, just end the game. Get me home. I had there a huge bet on the Chiefs. Did you watch any of anything from NBA All Star Weekend? Yeah, I saw the highlights of McClung. I was blown away by the dunk contest there. I cannot believe how badly rated. I mean, I would never watch the NBA All-Star game. I like right. the weekend usually. Three-point contest, whatever, the rookie, whatever it may be, or the celebrity game, dunk contest a little bit. If anything, I have more, much more interest though than the actual game. I can't believe how badly rated the game is. But did you watch any of it live? No, the game, absolutely not. And no. the actual... I don't know. I must have been doing something Saturday nights where I, I think I had to put my, oh no, I was home with my daughter alone. My wife was away. So I'm putting the baby up to sleep. I'm out of it. I mean, there was no shot. I'm watching on Twitter as I'm trying to rock my, my daughter to sleep. Mac, you know, Matt McClung, whatever the hell his name is with the dunk contest. I got to watch the highlights. I I, can imagine if it was a, you know, a big event, you, then you really would. And I guess I, yeah, I, I watched not one second. I didn't even see the highlights like, of the dunk. I saw nothing. And oh, then you I used, should watch it. It's must watch. He's actually that good. You have to watch it. <clears throat> yeah, I don't care. Um, and then right. did you watch any of the XFL? Zero. Not even Zero. wasted a second of my life. Did you? No, did not. Okay. No, no. It was the, I, I mean, watched I no – sp- but- I watched no, I mean, I'm not watching anything that was on this weekend. What I did watch, which I'll tell you, they, I think they do such a phenomenal job. I want to give them a little praise because I, all of the WWE stuff on A&E, they have like A&E legends, A&E rivals, like A&E does all these WWE documentaries and they're all just so well done. I watched a couple of those. Those are really good. The older ones. Cause there's a new season coming out, right? The new season started this past Sunday. Oh, right. It was the NWO one. Okay. Right, yeah, right. Right. I've seen, I think, the and I watched a couple. Old- yeah, I watched a couple of the old ones I had missed, like a Lex Luger one. It was really good. Yes. Um, we've got to talk about the new MLB rules. You're a big baseball guy. I want to get your take. So they're going to be major, major change. I mean, this is, I, th- I think it's actually being underplayed how significant these changes are going to be for the season. Now, the first one is the banning of the shift, which. I personally don't like, but it's not something I would like get up in arms over. Where do you stand on them banning the shift? Same. I'm not going to go. I I prefer it. I don't want to. And I get why you and others don't like it. You know, the hitters should be able to hit wherever they, they, you know, against the shift. And it's a strategy. It's a strategy play. I, I I know, but I just hate where it's gotten to where the hitters don't even care. So it, it to me, it made watching the game worse. So I think, regardless of where you stand, I do think it's going to be better for the game overall. So I'm happy. I agree. I agree. But I don't like when you take away something that's strat. You know, it's like, I've said this before, like in the NFL, like I said, you can't blitz on third down. I mean, it, that's what it's the equivalent of. But right. I, I'm, but it's not, it doesn't bother me that much. You could still right. have the <laughs> defensive strategy, just not you know, four guys on one side of the base playing in. Well, no, you have to have two, you have to have two guys on each side of the bag. Right. But you could move them. Let's say if they want to move them up the middle, you move them as close as you can. Look, I, I, I'm okay. I'm curious to see how it's going to play out, but I'm a fan of it. Yeah. Now the other change that's significant is pitch clock, 15 seconds. If there's nobody on base, 20 seconds for the pitcher to throw the ball to the plate. If there is a runner on base, I love this. I think it's going to lead to some anarchy in the beginning. I think it's going to take the players a little while to get used to, but I love this. I see no downside. I don't love it just because I don't like the idea of being rushed. I never thought that the pace of play is the problem. I think it's the quality of play, but I'm not going to go nuts about it. And I'm fascinated to see how it does get implemented and what type of impact. Anybody that I've talked to, like Andy Martino of SNY who covers – you know, the Mets and Yankees, and he's, you know, he saw this in action in the minor leagues, I think, last year, raved about it. And anybody yeah. who's, who's seen it says that it's going to change the game for the better. Everybody will love it. I'm shocked you, the pace of play doesn't bother you because I'll tell you, when I watch the games, you know, and the pitcher is just going for a walk around the mound if in between pitches. Right. I don't know. That drives me nuts. So I love this. And, the, and part of this rule, too, is the hitter has to be in the batter's box by the time there's eight seconds on the pitch clock, the batters are a big problem in this too because they step out, fix the gloves, t- 
touch their crotch, take off their right. hat. So I, I love all of this. I think it's I think it's going to be great for the game. Yeah, I'm fascinated to see how it's going to how it's going to play out. And look, I get they need to speed up the game in today's world where nobody has an attention span longer than you know two seconds. Right. And the other change, um, they're going to limit what a pitcher can do when there's a runner on base in terms of how many pickoff throws and stepping off. I don't love that one. I think that's tinkering again with sort of this the game there. I mean, if you have, I mean, nobody steals bases now, but let's say there is a base stealer on first and you're limiting how many times you could throw over. I, I, you know, I don't love that. But again, I'm not going to go crazy about it. But I think the idea is to now have base stealing become more right. of a thing, right? If you throw right. over there twice, now all of a sudden you're screwed. You can't throw over there anymore. <laughs> Maybe we get more action on the base paths. But the players don't want that. Players want home runs because that's what makes them money when they get contract. You're not going to get contract for stolen bases. So that, that is true. Know. And then the last one, which I don't understand on any level, is the bigger base. I don't know what that's supposed to do. But. Why? Player safety, I mean, I think is a part of well, it. Well, how is that safe to have a bigger base? Well, you, you have less happening in a smaller area. Cleats. You know, first base in particular with ankles, guys getting, you know, stepping on each other's feet. You know, whatever. I think that's I think still going to happen. Uh, well, the, they said it's a big – Buck Showalter said it looks like a pizza box, right? or maybe it was Cora who said that. Showalter said, though, it's startling how big the bases look in comparison to what you're used to. So that's another thing that might be weird. I don't understand that one at all. Um, I got to ask you because you grew, obviously you're a Mets fan. I'm a Yankee yeah. fan, and I still feel like it was part of my childhood, the passing of Tim McCarver. Were you a big as a Met fan? And I mean, that's your wheelhouse as a kid, probably seven, eight, nine years old, getting into baseball. McCarver and Ralph Kiner calling games locally in New York. Were you a big McCarver guy? Huge. Yeah. Loved him growing up. He was yeah. the guy with Ralph Kiner. And remember, like, you know, unfortunately for me, I only have 1986 to go back to. So I've watched the highlight video, which is a must watch. 1986, you to remember a million times. McCarver has all the highlights on there. I remember his calls. I grew up loving Tim McCarver. One, you'll get a kick out of the story. I told this on the air the other day because <clears throat> we were on as he we got the news that he passed away. I was live on the air actually filling in for Craig Carton on, on afternoons on the fan. And my one encounter with McCarver was that I saw him outside of Shea Stadium and went to get his autograph. With the blue. I was always a big broadcaster guy. Oh, my God, Tim McCarver, can you sign my hat? It's a blue Mets hat. I had a blue Sharpie pen. He goes, a blue pen on a blue hat. Now, who's going to see that? And kept <laughs> walking. And I was like, ah, him. You that gotta, is tremendous. You got to sign my book. And it, it scarred me. Now, I love McCarver, obviously. <laughs> Whatever, I get it. No big deal. But I called Francesa and Russo. To talk about that. when Remember when McCarver left for the Yankees? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So that was a big topic on the fan. I called Mike and Doug. Mike goes, maybe <clears> next <throat> time bring a white hat. That's funny. <laughs> oh, my God. That's tremendous. You know, I just, rem you know, you just, I met him once, too. I don't remember my memory so bad. I'm going to have to call my friends because we went, I went with friends to Fenway. And I think he was there signing, doing a book signing somewhere near there. And we bumped into him. Yeah. And wow, I don't remember the circumstances, but yeah, but I, you know, we had it really, really, really good as kids in New York. If you were into baseball, because the Mets had Ralph Kiner and McCarver, who were both characters. The Yankees had Phil Rizzuto and Bill White. And yep. it was always, you know, even as a, I was a Yankee fan, but I would watch the Mets as a kid and they were, you know, they were, Ralph Kiner was great and McCarver was great. Great. And I, know. I love them in my childhood. Yeah. And then, of course, McCarver with Fox. And I know that he's, you know, was the Mets guy, but he called all those Yankee dynasty postseason games alongside Joe Buck. Like, yeah. I love Tim McCarver. And I don't think there will, you never, you never say never, but he's the best baseball analyst that I have ever watched yeah. or listened to. And I, I know, you know, I, I don't know how much, I think this is like a Twitter social media thing, but like, you know, McCarver got a lot of backlash when social media started. And I think, you know, uh, I, he never, ever, ever bothered, bothered me. I always, always enjoyed, um, McCarver. So he loved, loved doing the game. So many analysts now it's a job to them. McCarver love. I know it's a job, but he loved doing it and he was passionate, obviously knowledgeable. I, I miss him. I, I loved him on the air. 
Now, another there was another death this week with the passing of Richard Belzer. And I bring this up for two reasons. One, I loved Belzer as a regular on the Howard Stern show. He was hilariously funny. And back was when Howard was on K-Rock, Belzer was on all the time, and I was a big fan. And the other reason I have to bring this up is because we have this longstanding argument, you and I, where you love Hulk Hogan, and yes. I hate Hulk Hogan, and Richard Belzer... And I think maybe now that now that I look back on it, it probably started my hatred of Hulk Hogan when he dropped Richard Belzer on his head and made the guy bleed. And Richard Belzer sued, and I don't know if he won or they settled, but Hulk Hogan did a bad thing there. I don't remember that, but I remember <laughs> reading about it. Was that when he said something like wrestling was fake or whatever and Hogan got ticked off? I Hogan put him in a sleeper hold and he yeah. and choked him out. And then Belzer collapsed to the ground. My excellent producer Shelby is telling me that Belzer got four hundred thousand from Hulk Hogan. He should have got more. All right, eh, it's a drop in the bucket for the Hulkster. I don't know <laughs> Belzer. I honestly, to this day, yeah. don't know what he did. But I do remember him when I used to watch mm -hmm. Stern on the E Channel. Right? Yeah. Wasn't he on there? Yeah. That's how I knew who he was when I would watch Howard. Well, then. he was a stand-up comic. Then he became very known for being on Law & Order, which I never watched. But he was a, he's huge on Law No, not Law & Well, and I think he was... Wait a second. And he was on Homicide. Was he on Law & Order too? Let me look. I'm going to look it up. Homicide is what... Is what... Um, Homicide was a show on NBC. Yeah, and he, and he was on Law & Order. So he was on both of those shows... But I knew him as a stand-up, and I knew him as a regular on Stern, and he was always <clears throat> so right. funny. So I had to mention that and get the shot in at Hulk Hogan. <laughs> the worst. You're nuts. <clears throat> the worst. Um, all right. I think that's all I got for this week. We'll read reviews next week. We're going to be in the slow time here now, now that the NFL is over, and we got to wait for like the NBA playoffs to kick in. I can't get into college basketball at all. Um are you getting into college hoops? No, not yet. I mean, once tournament play starts up, I'll get into that, you know, the conference tournaments. Although I say get yeah. into it, and then, like, at this point in my life, I'm not really into it anymore. I don't know why that is. But because I'll, I'll, it's a niche sport. It's become a niche sport. I know, sport. but I used to get into it. I used to, like, filling out the brackets, which I know you hate. I just don't care enough anymore at this particular – I don't have a yeah. rooting interest. I didn't go to a college. So, you know, unfortunately, Home Depot doesn't have a team or a Suffolk Community College, which is where, which is where I used to be. But I, I, I don't know. I don't have a rooting interest. I'm not betting big on these games. I do love the game if I'm watching it, the style of play. So I'll get into it come tournament time, but not as much as I used to. Oh, see, that's a big problem. So I, I – can't watch it at all. Then the tournaments come and I'll watch it. I'll bet the games. I get together with my buddies. I'll watch it. Yeah. And I just, I can't believe how bad the quality of play is. It's either, it, the whole game is missed layups, missed free throws and missed threes. It's, it's unbelievable how bad it is. I can't speak to the quality mm. of play, but I like the style better than the NBA where there's no defense, three point shooting. You get the half court style. Each possession matters. But yeah, you're right. Maybe the quality. One yeah. local thing for me that I like, Rutgers is good. So I'll follow that storyline. The former coach of Stony Brook, Steve Peichel, is now at Rutgers and he does a good job. So Nobody maybe I'll cares follow that. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm just saying a local <laughs> angle, something to, something to follow. Come on, support the local team. No, I'll follow what I bet. <laughs> That's what I'll do. I'll find out. I'll, I'll, I'll bet the first day of the tournament and then there's my rooting interest. But even with that, like I find after the first weekend, it's like then it's... I know. It's like a crash. It comes all, it all comes crashing down. All right, Sal, so appreciate it, and we'll see you next week. And uh, hopefully, you can get refreshed from the vacation. Sounds like you need a refreshing still. Yeah, I need a vacation yeah. from the vacation. Yeah. Going away with a wife and a two-year-old is not a vacation. But I was trying not back. to. I was trying not to get you to go there, and then you went there. All right, we'll see you next week. All right, talk to you later. All right. All right, my thanks to Ian Eagle and Sal Licata. If you are not a subscriber to the SI Media with Jimmy Trainer podcast, make sure you subscribe. Check out recent episodes. We had a great review of Fox's Super Bowl telecast last week with Brian Curtis of The Ringer. So listen to that. Richard Deitch, two weeks ago. Chris Berman, three weeks ago. Jason McCourty, four weeks ago. So check those out. Subscribe to the pod. Leave a review on Apple. We'll read it next week with Sal in the Train of Thoughts segment. All right, thanks for listening. Appreciate it. We'll see you next week. Stay safe and take care.